Hey, Ozark family, it is such a thrill to be a part of this year's preaching teaching convention. And uh, while like many of you, I'm disappointed that we can't all be together in person this year. Uh, I am thankful that we have the technology that allows us uh, to be gathered in this way and to have the convention because uh, I love the preaching teaching convention and I always have ever since I attended my very first one as a freshman on campus in the winter of 1995. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, I was a bit of a confused student. I was uh, at Ozark, not necessarily because I felt called into full-time ministry, but honestly, because I just didn't know what to do with my life. And uh, I remember uh, hearing about the preaching teaching convention, wasn't really sure what it was, but uh, I went with all the other students to the chapel. And I remember I sat on the back row up in the balcony, which is where all the super spiritual students sat. And I don't remember the theme of that year's convention, but I do remember the preacher and the sermon and the title of the session that I sat in that afternoon. And it was uh, delivered by a preacher from California. Maybe you've heard of him. His name's Dudley Rutherford. And the title of his message was The Greatest Job in the World. And uh, he was talking about the proclamation of God's word and, and he taught a bunch of passages on it. And then he, towards the end, he just said, you know, what is the greatest job in the world? And I wasn't the brightest bulb in the shelf, so I had no idea where he was going with it. And uh, so he's going through all these occupations and he said, is it a doctor? Because you make a lot of money and you help people. And he said, no disrespect to doctors, but no, that's not it. He says, is it a teacher because you get to influence the next generation? And he says, as much as we love our teachers, he said, that's not necessarily it either. And he went through a whole bunch of others, artists and athletes, and I had no idea where he was going. And I'm leaning forward at the edge of my seat, and I'll never forget, he said, the greatest job in the world is to stand and to deliver the message of God's grace to as many people as possible. And then what he said next would completely change the trajectory of my life. He said, and I believe that there's somebody sitting here today and God's calling you to preach and you need to listen and you need to sign up. And I felt like he was talking directly to me and it came completely out of left field and I was not happy about it. I was really, really uncomfortable. That's not what I wanted to hear and it's not what I wanted to do. And I remember going back to my dorm room that afternoon and just wrestling with God and, and finally just giving up and saying, okay, God, if that's what you want me to do, then I'll do it. And I've been preaching ever since. And that is part of the reason why I uh, got really excited when I got my assignment for this session. I, I love the, the title that I, I've been given. It's just simply this, preaching still matters. I believe that to my core. And so a couple of months ago, I, I sat down and I started to pray over this session and I uh, read through the passage that I'm gonna unpack here in just a minute. And there was this, this little adjustment that kept popping up in my mind over and over again as I would sit down to study. And I thought, no, I can't, I can't say that. I don't want to be misunderstood. But yet I felt like the Spirit of God kept bringing me back to this tiny little adjustment. And so if you'll allow me to, I'd like to make just a little adjustment to my, my, my theme. It would just simply be this. Good preaching still matters. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am not saying that my preaching is good preaching. I, I'm not saying this to be critical. I'm saying this to be confessional. There, there have been plenty of times when I have preached not so great messages. In fact, I, I would imagine that at least part of the reason why whoever it was decided these themes felt like this is a theme that we needed to address is because there's been some bad preaching. And bad preaching causes just a real mess in people's lives. Maybe you've been the recipient of some bad preaching. Maybe you've delivered some bad sermons. We all know what that feels like on a Monday morning. Maybe you know somebody who, because something was said in a message that hit them the wrong way, they, they walked away from God. They walked away from the church. There's all kinds of examples of this. Maybe somebody had their content right. Like technically their theology was sound and the content was good. But they didn't deliver it in a very gracious way. They didn't deliver it in a way that gave hope. They didn't deliver it in a way that really helped people. Maybe uh, somebody was really winsome. They, they were really entertaining. They, they were really funny. But there really wasn't the 
transformative substance of God's word that was delivered. They, they didn't even mention Jesus and the sacrifice that he's made for us. Maybe you have heard a sermon that maybe somebody yielded the word of God kind of like a blunt sword rather than a precise scalpel. And so because of that, maybe there are more and more ears that have grown deaf to, to preaching. Uh, one of my favorite preachers of all time is a guy that preached um, in London uh, during the World War II era. Um, I don't know how well his voice would translate today, but in his era, God used him in an incredible way. And he addresses this very thing. His name's Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he says this. He goes, the trouble with some of us is that we, we love preaching. That, that'd be me. But we are not always careful to make sure that we love the people to whom we are actually preaching. Ouch. If you lack this element of compassion for the people, you will also lack the pathos, which is a very vital element in all true preaching. Our Lord looked out upon the multitudes and saw them as sheep without a shepherd and was filled with compassion. And if you know nothing of this, you should not be in a pulpit for this is certain to come out in your preaching. That is so convicting. And so when I say that good preaching still matters, once again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that as if I've got it all figured out. Once again, I'm not saying it to be critical. I'm saying it to be confessional. And heaven knows as well as so much of my church that there have been weekends where I, I, I just didn't deliver God's word in a very effective way. There, there have been weekends when my frustration with our people has sort of outpaced my love and compassion for them. I, I remember um, one week, several years ago, I was talking to a friend and mentor of mine, um, Mark Scott. And uh, I confessed to him that the previous weekend, I just really botched a sermon. I mean, I'm, I'm like uh, uh, whiffed it big time. And uh, because of that, I had some emails in my inbox and I was really licking my wounds and I was talking to him and I just said, Mark, I really messed that sermon up. And I'll never forget, he looked right at me and in only the way that Mark Scott can say it, and if you know Mark, you might imagine how he could say this. I'm not even gonna attempt to do an impersonation of him, although I do have a pretty good one. But Mark said this, he looked at me and he goes, well, Aaron, you live to preach another Sunday. In other words, he said, get back up on that horse, get back in the driver's seat, don't give up, you stay after it. But then I'll never forget what he said next. He, he looked at me with all sincerity and he goes, but Aaron, do it better. Resolve to do it better. And if I could just for a minute, just look right into the camera and talk to everyone who, who preaches on a regular basis. I, I know that the last 10 to 12 months has been a tough, tough season for everybody, but it's been a tough season for preachers. And in the beginning of all this, we went from preaching to real life people, to empty rooms, into cameras, and it was, it, it was really painful. And then over the last several months, as people have begun to come back to, to church, it's just half filled or even less rooms. And you, you just wonder how effective you're, you're really being. And there have probably been some times, given all the, the social uh, unrest and the division in our country, you just wonder if you're doing a very good job. And maybe there have been some weekends, if you're anything like me, where you walked away and you just said, I don't think that was very good. And can I just say, you live to preach another Sunday. Keep going, keep doing it, but resolve to do it better. And I love what Tim Keller says about learning to preach. He said that it takes roughly 300 deliveries of a sermon, anecdotally, to even learn to begin to preach one good one. And I would say, anecdotally, I agree with him. I, I would say learning to preach is sort of like learning to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You just aren't going to learn it by doing it one time or even several times. You've just got to get back in the dojo over and over and over again and resolve to not give up. And so I want to be really, really clear. We, we need to give lots and lots of grace to those who preach. We, we don't want to discourage someone's calling to preach before the spark of that calling can fan into a flame. We need more communicators of God's word and we need better communicators of God's word. In fact, Romans chapter 10, it says it, says it so well. How can they hear about God's grace without someone telling them. 
And you know, when you stop to think about what it is that we are trying to accomplish when we stand up here in our weakness and deliver God's word, the list of things that come against us and that message landing in a transformative way is just as long as my arm. I sat down and I tried to list a few things that are just sort of working against the effectiveness of preaching. At the top of my list would maybe just be my own self-esteem. Sometimes I just want people to like me too much and that affects the delivery. Short attention spans. We're told over and over again that people just won't pay attention longer than 21 minutes because that's about the average length of a show on Netflix. And I don't know if that's entirely true. Words have oftentimes been eclipsed by images, videos, and sound bites. One is just our general rebellion, stubbornness, and sin as a people. That's certainly working against the effectiveness of a message. Negative perceptions of what it even is. One one definition that I looked up of preaching said this, that preaching to give advice in an irritating way. And I read that and I was like, oh, come on. And yet, and you've probably heard that before. Like somebody maybe comes up to you and they go, hey, I, mean, I don't mean to preach at you. It's just sort of like seen in like a negative sort of a, of a way. And yet, as much as I hate to admit it, it's probably got to at least be a little bit of a nugget of truth in there somewhere. And so we need to resolve to do it better and to overcome some of those obstacles. I think... This is at least part of what was on Paul's mind when he writes these words about preaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. (laughs) They were offended and they said it was nonsense. Kind of sounds like my email inbox on a Monday morning. And then he goes on and he says, but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. See, this right here is why preaching still matters. God chooses to use the foolishness of our preaching. What what does that mean? Well, it means the deficiencies of our communication, the, the shortcomings of our study, the, the sermons we bomb, the, the, the humor that doesn't land. God says, hey, listen, I'll, I'll take all of that as long as it's a willing, surrendered heart and I'll watch me do, breathe supernatural wind into your feeble words to change other people's lives. He is inviting us to be a part of it. And that is just a mind-blowing thought. God says, hey, th- th- your preaching is a foolish plan, but watch me flex. Watch me do with it what only I can. And uh, it, kind of, if you, it kind of reminds me, you know, God has given us a message and he says, I want you to pass it on and pass it on and pass it on from generation to generation. And it kind of reminds me of the game that we used to play in elementary school where uh, everybody would sit around in a circle in the classroom and the teacher would give uh, a message in one of the kids' ears and then they would turn and whisper it to the next and the next and the next all the way around the room until you get to the last student and they say, okay, what's the message? And the message from the teacher started out as Bobby chews bubble gum. But by the time it got all the way around the classroom, it was Barbara likes to bang her drum. And you're like, how in the world did that message get changed and messed up? And if you think that it's painful to sit through a bad sermon, and if you think that it's humiliating to preach a bad sermon, just imagine how God feels about it. Just imagine how God's up there going, oh man, like, you know, you, you, you mess that up once again. And yet here is the amazing thing about God he is he allows it. And he says, just give me one surrendered heart and as flawed as your motives, and believe me, there have been times when my motives to preach have been flawed. And he says, as incomplete as your study. And there have been weeks when I've rushed the study. He says, as deficient as your oratory skills. He says, and yes, maybe even as wonky as your theology at times, listen, this foolish plan 
is more effective than any other human strategy. The delivery of God's word has been changing people's lives for 2,000 years. And it, I believe that God will continue to use it to change people's lives. And so we do not give up because preaching, it still matters. And the question that I wanna just spend the rest of my time unpacking is just one word. It's just this question, why? Why does God use it in the way that he does and how can we get in alignment with his spirit so that way God uses our preaching to change people's lives. Well, the first thing that I would point out is that on the very first page of the Bible, God gets everything kicked off by speaking. See, the world began with a sermon. In the first chapter of Genesis, we see the phrase, God said, 10 times. And then we read seven times the phrase, God saw. God, God, God said, and then God saw what his sermon had accomplished. See, there's power when God speaks. And then we see that um, Satan shows up and he's got a sermon of his own. It's, there's nothing, there's no original content. Satan plagiarizes everything. He takes God's, God's word and all he does is he just twists it. And he did, his favorite sermon is, did God really say? Because I don't think he really said. I think he said this. And he derailed everything with our first parents, Adam and Eve. And sermons are being preached all the time. Sermons are being preached in songs, in movies, in social media, in news outlets. They, they are sermons that inform and influence the way that we think, what we value, and what we consider important in life. They shape our view of God and others and his world. And in the Old Testament, to counteract a lot of the false sermons that were being delivered, God raises up and sends out a succession of prophet preachers to declare his word clearly with compassion and authority. And those prophets continually use this phrase over and over again. Thus saith the Lord. They said it hundreds and hundreds of times. Why? Well, because God's got some stuff that he wants to say. And throughout scripture, we see that God's pattern is that he's got something that he wants said. And so he goes and he finds a reluctant person to say it through. You see, preaching still matters because it is amplifying what God once said with clarity, passion, and conviction. In the Greco-Roman world, oftentimes this was found in somebody who would speak up that they were known as uh, a uh, cariso. And this was somebody that was of the royal court. They were commissioned by the ruler to get out a message with a strong and resonant voice. And that word sort of uh, stresses a, a kind of a gravity and an authority, like it has a, a sense of urgency to it. Like here's a message and it's got to be delivered. Now here's what that does to me on a personal level. On the one hand, when I think about that, like it fires me up. I'm like, man, let's go. I'm ready to do it. On the other hand, scares me to death and it results in a ton of pressure. When I begin to stop and to really realize what is at stake when I stand on this stage and I open my mouth and I say, thus saith the Lord. And it explains at least in part why this is so difficult to do. You see, preaching one sermon is one thing, but preaching multiple sermons on a regular basis in such a way that gives voice to what God once said with clarity, passion, and conviction <laughs> it's nearly impossible, especially if I'm beginning to do it in my own strength. Listen to how James McDonald describes this. This really, um, I, I really resonate with this, his description. He says, biblical preaching demands effort, drains energy, and distracts attention away from other things that matter too, but demand less. Real preaching requires any offense to be resolved, sin to be surrendered and distraction to be diminished. It's easy to do poorly and terrifically difficult to do well once. 
the better you preach, the greater the demand that you do it great again next week because we are bringing our friends. No matter how good the meal, take a deep breath because they will be just as hungry in less than seven days and you need to know you have it well before then. Good preaching is a love-hate relationship. I love preaching. I hate preparing. I love seeing God work. I hate the pressure of needing to see it again. I love the Lord and his word. I hate the battle he allows to accompany its proclamation. I deeply resonate with that description. And all the preachers listening to this right now, I bet you do too. And when I often describe that struggle to people who don't preach on a regular basis, you want to know one of the most common things I get back is they they look at me a little bit confused, a little bit of a deer in headlights, like they don't know what I'm talking about. And they say, well, Aaron, you do a good job. (laughs) <laughs> that's not what I needed from you right there, right? They, they look at me and they say, Aaron, do you need a vacation? Like, I think you need to relax. I think you're taking yourself a little too seriously, perhaps. But when I was a younger preacher, the pressure of preaching primarily came because I wanted to do a good job. I wanted the approval of those listening. And I, I can honestly say that the older I get, the, the longer I preach, like that's not as much of a concern of mine, but it's because I'm beginning to see more and more what really is at stake. Preaching must succeed. Partly for this reason. Have you ever been to Europe and walked through some of the old, beautiful churches that are over there? I've got a a friend uh, who's a, a pastor in East Germany and I've been over to visit him and we've walked through some of the old churches and he pointed out to me, he said, Aaron, this is the, one of the most atheistic regions in the world. But he said, this is actually where the Reformation started. And you gotta, just got to go, man, what in the world happened? And you walk through some of these old beautiful churches that used to be full of life. They used to they have these big ornate pulpits that are kind of built up in the air and, and the proclamation of God's word used to ring out for over hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet you, now you look at it, you feel like you're walking through looking at the bones of an old dinosaur, like it's dead. You gotta go, man, what in the world happened? And I would simply suggest this, churches die because God's voice in them died first. And when we stop listening to what God once said, our churches begin to die a very slow and painful death. So it's almost as if every time we stand up to preach, Through the power of his spirit, we're sort of breathing life back into the body of Christ. The gravity of the message is so vitally important. Listen, preaching still matters because God, because it is amplifying what God once said with clarity, passion, and conviction. And so let me just very quickly break that down. Preaching that matters is clear. It has to be clear. I was... um, in Colorado a few weeks ago, and I was talking to a a preacher that I deeply respect out there, and he just brought out this point. We were at his house talking, and he said, you know, Aaron, he said, as complicated as the world has been over the last year, and as much uh, information is coming at our people, it's almost like information overload. We just can't process it all. He said, we have got to be disciplined to make our sermons as clear as possible. We cannot afford to be confusing. We cannot afford to to juke them and lose them with some thought that they just can't fully process. We've got to work doubly hard at making it really, really clear. So a question that I just have out in front of me as I prepare is what do I want you to know? And I got to be super, super clear about that. You see, preaching that still matters. What it does is it pulls the wisdom of God's word off the top shelf and it makes it accessible to every single person who is listening, regardless of where they are in their spiritual journey. It clarifies what the gospel is and just as importantly, what it isn't. And it always, always, always presents the hope that can be found in Jesus. Please don't ever end your sermon without ever clarifying the hope that can be found for somebody in Jesus right then and there. And we just can't afford to make this more difficult to understand than it needs to be. 
You see, I uh, believe that all true preaching is expository preaching in the sense that in the message, you take a passage and you unpack it, you explain it, and you apply it to people's lives. Because apart from God's word, we have nothing to say. But I will say that expository preaching can be done poorly. I would say that expository preaching at its worst digresses into a sort of oral commentary where it's just academic in nature. It's somewhat straightforward. It's, it, it's, it's like the potatoes, you know, without any butter and salt. Like it's, it's, it's good, like the nutrients are there, but it's not real easy to necessarily take in. Like there's, there's not necessarily the ethos and the pathos that is needed for somebody to really receive that. But I would also say that thematic preaching at its worst is sort of like, well, you know, I heard this really cool story or I've got this joke that I want to tell. And so let me kind of build the sermon around that and throw in some passages as kind of seasoning. And that doesn't do any good either. And so we don't want to be overly academic, nor do we want to be overly emotional. Instead, we want to harness the light of logic and the heat of emotion. I love how Spurgeon said this. He said, some preachers are all light and no fire, while others are all fire and no light. What we want is both fire and light. We've got to be clear. Here's the second thing. Preaching that matters is passionate. And here's the question that I have out in front of me as I prep every message. What do I want people to feel this is sort of like that, that heart level. It's what stirs them to say, I've got to listen and apply what it is that God is saying to me. And there should be a humility that is evident in the delivery. And yet at the same time, a confidence in the delivery, in what God wants revealed and what it is that he wants said and that this really does matter. And, and it's when you it's when you get away from your notes and you begin to speak from the heart and you begin to see that this is beginning to, to land with people. I know that for me, there's the, these different phases of the sermon delivery. Like when I stand up and kind of give a, an introduction, the people's disposition is sort of casual. Maybe somebody's kind of got their arm around their loved one. Maybe a mom is kind of tending to her kids, trying to get them, you know, uh, coloring or whatever as the message begins to get started. And then you begin to introduce it and you begin to work through and you begin to teach. And, and I notice though that people's body language through the process of the sermon begins to change when the Spirit of God's speaking. And my favorite part of the delivery, when things seem to be banging on all cylinders, is when you can almost cut the tension with the knife in the room and people are no longer leaning back. They are no longer distracted by their phones or whatever. But they're on the edge of their seat, leaning forward with their jaws slightly gaped open. And I know that at that moment, that is a sacred moment. That the spirit of God is working in that moment. And the passion of the message can literally break through some of the hardest of hearts. If we were to go back to my boy, Martin Lloyd-Jones, once again, he gives a great uh, definition of this. He says, what is preaching? And he says, it is logic on fire. Eloquent reason. Are these contradictions? Of course they aren't. Reason concerning this truth ought to be mightily eloquent as you see it in the cause of the Apostle Paul, as a case of the Apostle Paul and others. Well, I love this phrase. It is theology on fire. And a theology which does not take fire, I maintain, is a defective theology. The truth of God's word should move people towards some sort of action. It is not hype, it is hope. And I know that this begins to happen when I've adequately prepared the, the message and then it is as if uh, I begin to, to, to get away from my notes and I start talking faster than I can process. And that's also a scary moment. <laughs> but I know that in that moment that the Spirit of God is at work. I'm high wiring without a net. And it is a sacred, sacred time. It's got to be passionate. Here's the last thing. Preaching that matters is convincing. Preaching that matters is convincing. So the question that I ask in my prep is what do I want you to do? 
Biblical preaching should correct people and encourage them simultaneously. Now to be clear, when I say convincing, I'm not saying that our job is to convince anybody. I actually think when we try to convince people, that's when a lot of preaching goes bad. That's when it begins to feel a little bit like a billy club. That begins when it, when it feels a little bit legalistic and people begin to refuse. I, we are not called to convince anybody of anything. The job of the, of the preacher is to simply identify the obstacles that are in the path from somebody getting to Jesus and you just remove them. We are sort of the demolition crew. I love John the Baptist's description of this. He said his, his task was to clear the way, was to clear the path to get people to Jesus. Jesus himself said that he is drawing all men and women unto himself. God is wooing people. We've got to trust that. And so our job is to just clear away the obstacles, whatever they may be, so that people can get to Jesus and to continue to be patient if it takes some longer than others. We've got to be patient and, and we've, uh, to, with those who are slow to believe biblical truth and those who struggle to understand it. Jude one twenty two says, be merciful to those who doubt. And one of the best ways I'm learning uh, to be convincing is to just be a human being, <laughs> to be authentic, to not say, hey, do as I do, but to say, hey, I'm in the struggle with you. That, that I'm, I'm on this journey. I haven't got this figured out either. Like I, I'm, I'm running after this. Like I, I still continue to fall. And when you begin to show people your humanity, then it begins to connect. One way to be convincing, as simple as this may sound, is, is the appropriate use of humor. Like it is amazing. Like Jesus used humor. I think so much of it gets lost on it on us, but what humor does is it opens people up. It, it relaxes their apprehensions and the guard comes down. One of my favorite preachers that used humor so well was Wayne Smith. Many of you remember Wayne. He preached at Southland uh, Christian Church in Lexington for years and years and years. And, I, and Wayne used humor so well. And one time I was listening to Wayne talk and he said, one of the things I like to do is he goes, I like to get people laughing so hard that their head throws back and their throats are exposed. And then I slice their throats. And this, that, that's, that's, I've seen that over and over again where God will use humor to just relax the tension. So here's one of the things that I've begun to do is that when I'm in the green room, before I come out to preach, I'm praying, I'm preparing my heart. I'm asking God to please use my study, to please use my words, to minimize my weaknesses so that the message will come through. But here recently, I, I've never had the courage to pray this because it always seemed a little bit vain, but here recently I've begun to pray it. And God, could you make me funny? <laughs> I'm not talking about corny dad jokes. I'm not talking about jokes you get off the internet. I'm talking about just that very natural humor that just is unscripted that just comes out. So that way it softens the hardness of somebody's heart and the life-changing message of the gospel might break through. Listen, preaching still matters. How it works, I don't always know. I don't always know the supernatural thing that takes place when, when God works through our feeble words, but yet I've seen it over and over again. Several years ago, I got an email on a Monday morning from a, from a man who had, he and his wife had visited our church the day before and didn't have any sort of church background. Maybe, maybe he had some sort of a Catholic background in his past. I'm not quite sure, but uh, they'd been invited by a friend and they came somewhat reluctantly, but they had a great experience. That's what you always want to read. And uh, so I'm reading about his experience. He said, man, we were blown away. This wasn't what we thought. Everybody was so friendly. We love the experience. We love the music. And he said, and, and, and I liked your talk. That's what he called it. He goes, I liked your talk, okay. But he said, uh, but I had a big problem with it. He goes, I noticed that you referred to the Bible a lot. And he said, I don't trust the Bible. I don't like the Bible. I don't understand the Bible. And he said, what I want to know is, are you going to always refer to the Bible as much as you did yesterday? Because if you do, then we're going to have a big problem. And so <laughs> I emailed him back and I said, man, I'm so glad that you came. I'm so glad you had a great experience. You're welcome anytime. I said, but we're probably going to have a problem because I'm in a 
not only be referring to it, I'm going to be teaching out of it every single week. And I said, and I understand maybe some of your objections with it. And I said, but could you just do me a favor? Could you just come for, for maybe three months? And could you just listen? And could you just um, hear what God's word is saying and maybe even apply a couple things and just see if it works, see what it might do in your life? And to his credit, he agreed to do that. And it was several months later that he walked down into the baptistry and we got to baptize him and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he serves on our production team now and he invites people from work all the time. And every now and then he'll joke around with me. He'll say, Aaron, you remember the first email I sent you? And I go, I remember. The power of God's word can break through some of the hardest, most cynical hearts. And I know right now the world seems really, really dark. And I just want to encourage those of you who listen to preaching and know preachers to continue to pray and encourage them because preaching still matters now more than ever. And I want to say to you, those of you who preach on a regular basis, I know this last year has been tough. And if you're anything like me, there have probably been a few moments where you just wanted to give up and go do something else. You didn't know if it was making any difference. Can I just say to you, It's making a difference. God still has some things he once said with clarity, passion, and conviction now more than ever. So live to preach another Sunday, but resolve to do it better because it still matters.